Hello everyone, welcome to the very first episode of Geophiles in the Field. Today is going to be the Presque Isle Peridotite. And you look behind me and you see, well, this isn't the field. We will get to that. I did film some video over the holiday weekend, Labor Day, and the wind was just too bad, so I need to voice over it. But we will get there and I need to give you a little background first. First, I need to talk about Peridotite. Peridotite is an ultra mafic igneous rock. What that means is there's no light colored felsic minerals in this thing. As a matter of fact, we don't even use the QAPF diagram to plot this stuff. We use a different plot system. But what you need to really know about it is that it's very high in iron and it does alter easily. Uh, the olivines will alter and this particular location of the peridotite is serpentized a little bit, but it is the most unaltered out of all the locations in the upper peninsula of the peridotite. So we've got that going for us and I was able to take samples on the peridotite and something else which we're going to get to which I do plan on dating. There are lots of publications on this peridotite, either directly or involving it to some degree. Uh, but for all the work that's been done, these are the most recent. Uh, their stuff goes back a lot further than this to the 70s. No one's ever dated it, and it probably won't get a solid good date, but how will we know if we don't try? <laughs> but there's something else I want to date now as well associated with that, which I'll get into when I get into the vid field video here. Now, there are some field relations of questionable who, which came first, the law of superposition and Steno's other laws are a little hard to decipher here. We do have some good exposures and you're going to see that, but they're low exposures for the most part. The contact is decently exposed between the peridotite and the Jacobsville group of sandstones. But it's hard to tell which came first, the peridotite or the Jacobsville. And I'm going to address that in the video when you see the field stuff. And people have wildly varying interpretations of the age of this thing. Like I said, it's never been dated. So any age that we have is complete guesswork. Some people think that Jacobsville was deposited on top of the peridotite. And in the field, I have walked this many times. I have never seen a peridotite classed within the conglomerate of the Jacobsville. I've personally never seen it. I've seen some dark rocks that can be mistaken for peridotite, but there's never been any chemical analysis done on the pebbles either. So some people think the peridotite is as old as late Archean. We're talking 2,900 million years ago, but it could be a lot younger. And when I say younger, I mean Neoproterozoic, like maybe as young as 600 million years ago. But it's probably not. It's not, not. it's not likely Archean at all. And it's not likely that young either. As a guess, I would have to say it's probably Pinocchian because Little Presque Isle, which we, that's that island we walk to uh, on occasion to the northwest, has some Pinocchian ultramafic rocks in it. And those have been successfully dated. So it could be Pinocchian, but personally, I think it's related to Mid-Continental Rift. I think it's very late, probably around 900 million years ago. And when we get into the field video, I'll explain why I think it is that way. But, you know, we can only know for sure if we date it. Now, the Jacobsville is that sandstone rock, and it does have intrusions in it of carbonite, an igneous carbonate rock. And it's been assumed that the carbonanite is just altered peridotite. I don't think it is. You look at the contact where the sills of this carbonanite exist and you see highly deformed alteration. I think it's later hydrothermal activity. And I'll get into that as well. 
So anyway, let's get started with the feel video. This here is one of my favorite outcrops. Let's start with the location first. And you can see that it, the contact is exposed, but here my hands on the Jacobsville and you look at it and you can see it's very altered. There's a lot of little faults in here and going different ways, normal, reverse, oblique, strike, slip, all that stuff. They're not very big, but you can see the high deformation. You can see the white in it, which is calcite, which is probably from alteration. The black stuff I'm standing on, that's the peridotite. And here, right here is where the contact is exposed at this location. And the question here is, which is older, the Jacobsville or the peridotite? And most people assume the peridotite is, but you look at this here and you see these cross light veins in the peridotite, that's, all, that's later hydrothermal activity, due, that's carbononite. But you come down and you see that the peridotite doesn't, isn't well integrated. It weathers really easily as most ultramafic crocs. So the sandstone tends to stand up to erosion better but the way the Jacobsville looks in relationship to the peridotite, it looks like the peridotite came up and intruded into the base of the Jacobsville here. And here you see this green here, that's carbononite. This is, I'm gonna date this as well, what I have my hands on right here. I've taken samples of this, and that seems to be secondary hydrothermal activity. The field relationships, the contacts between the green carbonite, or it's a green rock, and the peridotite is sharp. They're two separate events, and you can tell that just by the relationship and the deformation within the Jacobsville. The Jacobsville is deformed around this carbonite, which is likely due to the injections of hydrothermal hot fluids from below after the peridotite was injected, I believe, into the base of the Jacobsville. Because you look at the Jacobsville here, and it looks a lot more like the Orienta formation with the Jackson Creek in her tonguing. So that's what we see at Little Presque Isle as well, except there's no intrusions like this associated there. But you come down, so you have your carbonite here, which occurred after the peridotite, and and after the Jacobsville is deposited, because it intrudes the Jacobsville, clearly intrudes it. And you see laminations, which are mostly calcite, and calcite on the rock face, and these other little calcite veins, which were probably injected along with the carbonite into the Jacobsville. There's a lot of contact metamorphism at this outcrop. And you come down, and here you see it goes into Lake Superior. That's Lake Superior behind me. So it has to be a second uh, igneous event after this black peridotite was injected, I believe, into the base of the Jacobsville. And if I can successfully at least date the carbonite, I can get a age for the Jacobsville at this spot. And this is... If I can successfully do this, this will be the only known intrusion within the Jacobsville. Now, this carbonite is probably of magmatic origin uh, with a lot of hydrothermal fluids within it. And you can see the Jacobsville here just follows wonky uh, faults and other stuff as well. So that's the location of my favorite outcrop. And I hope you can see how jumbled the field relationships are. And nowhere in that video do you see black cobbles or pebbles within the Jacobsville. It's very clean except for that green carbonite intrudes it. So like I said, I've never seen them. I mean, the Jackson Creek formation of the Jacobsville intertongues with that basal orienta. I redefined that back uh, four years ago now, and this was one of the outcrops I looked at. And I looked at the conglomerate, and it's mostly silicas, uh, siliceous carbonate rocks like dolo stones, a lot of silica in them. Uh, there's some little bits of granites in there as well, but and some little green-looking, probably 
greenstone type rocks, we'll just use that generic term. I didn't see anything that even looked black or looked like a basalt. But I also didn't see anything typically associated with the Big Continental Rift either, like I didn't see the red basalts or any of those rhyolites. So is the Jacobsville older than a peridotite or younger? If I had to bet right now before I do dating, I'm going to bet it's maybe close to the same age or slightly younger. You look at the contact metamorphism within the Jacobsville, and it looks like the prototype, like you had the Jacobsville deposited like this, and the prototype comes in and starts deforming that Jacobsville with it as it intrudes it. That's what it looks like to me. The carbonite is unquestionably younger because it is in within the Jacobsville, and I hope I can successfully date that. But there's other places on, on Presque Isle where the contact is also decently exposed and it's what led me to the hypothesis that the carbonite is a secondary hydrothermal event that postdates the peridotite or is really close to the same age as the peridotite. Okay so there's another little culvertized area if you will like a little setback where people like to jump off of the cliffs in the summer. Here we are going to look at the contact between the black peridotite, the green carbonite, and the Jacobsville. And you look here and you can see the black peridotite is slightly greenish in places, probably all altered by the post uh, green carbonite. And here you see the green carbonite kind of on top of it. And this is what would make people think it's an altered zone. But you look at it, you see black peridotite within it. It's brecciated here. This has, So this would have followed the line of the intrusion. You can see it over here. But it's not a part of the intrusion. It didn't weather from it. And there's the contact below my fingers, the peridotite. And above it's the Jacobsville. And that's peridotite where my fingers are pointing. So Here's the contact with the Jacobsville and the prototype there. It's sharp, but you don't see, and you don't see any green carbonite. So, but you do just to the right. <laughs> so, the carbonite has to be either really close to or after the injection of the prototype. But it is younger than it based on field relationships. You can see that the fractures of the prototype are not the same as in the Jacobsville, indicating that it was either positive first or secondary. The Jacobsville, but you look at the Jacobsville here and it's highly altered where contact directly with the peridotite. So it, it looks as if the peridotite does intrude the Jacobsville. We know the Jacobsville is somewhere between 600 and 950 million years old. And here's the contact and there is some carbonite in it, which doesn't seem to be from weathering. What you see in this photo here, you can see my right arm, which is roughly following the trend, the dip of the Jacobsville formation. My left hand here, points down into the ground and it's the contact between the Jacobsville and the peridotite and carbonite layers and it follows the cleavage if you will for lack of a better term right there and as you can see by the position of both of my arms uh, that these two are at nearly right angles to one another indicating the peridotite is intruded into the Jacobsville because if the Jacobsville was deposited on top of this it would have a similar dip to where my left arm is and would and would level out as it comes up it wouldn't come into it like it does here. And just so you know, my right foot is on the actual contact between the peridotite and the Jacobsville, and my left foot is standing on the carbonite injected on top of the peridotite. That's where that breccia is. The peridotite obviously does not have beds within it because it's one igneous intrusion mass, but when it weathers, and this, like I said, it's ultramafic, so it weathers real easy, it's going to fracture along, like if this is your shape of your intrusion, it's going to fracture along that way. And those fractures do not line up with the Jacobsville bedding at all. And here we see clasts within the Jacobsville, like red shales, things like that mud class, which were pretty typical, but we don't see any peridotite in it at all right here. 
I don't know where it was observed. I need to get a hold of that, of Lance's thesis. I don't have it. But to me, it doesn't look like the peridotite is older than the Jacobsville. Now, the peridotite is really well exposed on the northwest, north end of Presque Isle. But we're going to go back to the west and to the south along the main trail that everyone walks on. And what you see in the Jacobsville is you see the very typical bedding within it. You see this little modeling of light and dark beds here, but you also see these conglomerates. Those are tongues of the Jackson Creek. There are likely much more massive faults within the area. They're just not exposed because they're probably under the lake, like Little Presque Isle. I suspect a north south trending fault just off the island. And the Jackson Creek is fault proximal in origin. Now here, it's just tongues and lenses within the basal orienta formation. It, so it can be included within the orienta. I wouldn't necessarily say, you know, that is Jackson Creek formation. There's other cool field relationships too that I'm gonna touch on. These, Two boulders you see here are Jacobsville, but they are the bottom of the Quaternary Glacial stuff sitting on top of it. So they were derived locally, but from where I don't know. And they have agates and stuff in it. But you come around here and you can follow the beds. You can see this calcareous light colored bed and it's really weathered right here. And then it's gone. We'll get to that because that is a glacial erratic of gneiss within it. And that is an old trough glacial stream or something like that cut into the Jacobsville and that green carbonate layer is cuts out cuts back in and here it is well exposed now these carbonate beds are primary they were deposited the Jacobsville and you see more sandy typical coarser grained arcoses and here's the contact with the quaternary glacial stuff right there so you in this area you have the occasional conglomerate and uh, Carbonaceous shale is essentially what it is in the area within the Jacobs film. And some of this may be hydrothermal alteration of the Jacobs film, but it seems to be primary deposits right here. So we're out of the influence essentially right here of that peridotite intrusion and carbononite hydrothermal activity, even though we aren't that much further south. Uh, than the actual outcrop. So here we don't really see the effects of that intrusion. So there's no contact metamorphism here. The contact metamorphism is pretty close to that peridotite intrusion and the carbononite intrusions as well. So I just wanted to show you that cool field relationship between the Jacobsville and the much younger quaternary deposits on top, even though they're really thin. But here we are outside of the influence of the hydrothermal event that created the contact metamorphism of the Jacobsville, where it's in contact with the peridotite. The contact metamorphism doesn't seem to go very far away from the peridotite or the carbononite. It seems to be localized in that area, maybe extending 20, 30 meters at the most. So 65 to 100 feet, something like that. I haven't actually walked it out. I need a boat to do that because it's, it's exposed on the lake and the erosion has gotten rid of the shore there. In this area, just a little bit south of where we were, there's no evidence of metamorphism in the Jacobsville at all. It could be buried and it probably is. So. The effects of this peridotite intrusion fade very quickly away from where it is an outcrop. So the, the contact metamorphic relationship between the peridotite, the carbonite, and the Jacobsville doesn't really answer the question of which is older. Uh, we could have gotten the peridotite, you know, could have been a surface and deposit, but it doesn't look that way. It looks very mounded. So like it pushed through something and then what's on top could have been eroded. So we get that. And then the Jacobsville could have been deposited on top of that. And then the later carbonite hydrothermal activity and lavas came in and contact metamorphism occurred, you know, near the contact with the peridotite. 
that could have happened. Or as the Jacobsville was being deposited as the sand, that prototite intrusion came in, pushed the beds, which is what we see at the contact to form the beds, cause minor faulting, whatnot within it, and, and then either right as that intrusion had cooled, or around the time that intrusion had cooled, or after that carbonite was injected following the weak zone, which would have been the contact with the prototite and up into the Jacobsville, but not going very far. It's kind of like a last gasp of the intrusion, if you will. That's one of the reasons why I think the carbonite might be actually not much younger than the peridotite instead of significantly younger. But like I said, unless we can successfully date the peridotite and the carbonite, those questions will remain unknowns. So there are still mysteries in geology to be figured out. We don't know everything. We don't even think we know everything. And this is one of those spots where there's question marks all over the place and you have just piles of questions on top of little scraps of answers. And like I said, there's been a lot of work done. I don't want to negate the amount of work that has been done. There's been a lot of chemical analyses and stuff like that in the in papers, you know, and theses and dissertations and things as such. And it is good work, but we need to get this stuff dated. And hopefully I can do that. But anyway, that's it. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. I hope you enjoyed this first episode and I hope you learned something. Mm -hmm.